Well, amen. It's, uh, it's a blessing to get to spend more time around everyone here. We, uh, uh, some of you might remember my oldest son was here a couple of years ago, uh, just for a short period of time when you guys were working on the parking lot, Jeshua. And um, he, uh, uh, please do not judge us too harshly by him. He's, he's not the best of our kids, uh, it's, you know, just so maybe a poor example but uh, no, I'm just kidding. We, he's um, pray for him. He actually um, uh, got married in March, and uh, they're in our Bible college, and he's in tr- in training uh, there in our church to go to Portugal as missionaries. And so, um, be uh, a few years down the road uh, before they're ready to go. But uh, looking forward to what God's going to do in their lives. We actually have uh, four children. We got married. We kind of have a, have a little bit of a weird. Um, story, I guess. We, we met on, at youth camp. Angela and I met at church youth camp in Missouri, Sagmont, Missouri. We met on Monday, and we got engaged that Thursday. Yeah, and then um, that was in June. We got married in October, October 1st. I had to wait until she turned 18. Her mom wouldn't uh, sign for her. So anyway, we started having kids fairly early in our marriage, and so all of my kids are grown now. My youngest is 19, and he's graduated from high school. He's still at home, but working a job and getting things uh, moving forward for life. And um, we now have three grandkids. And so my older three of our four kids, my older three, are all married. And, and we're constantly, when we take our grandkids places, people um, will comment about how wonderful our children are. And we're like, these aren't our children. These are our grandchildren. <clears throat> you could tell that by the fact they're calling us Oma and Opa, not Mommy and Daddy, you know. But, um, but uh, you know, we're just so young, so young. And um, uh, what a blessing, amen, to, to be able to have. I tell you, grandkids are wonderful. And I told our church this, being a grandpa is fantastic. It's one of the best things in this world. Being married to a grandma is a little troubling. I'm being honest, <clears throat> it was a little troubling, but um, anyway, kids are wonderful, and we uh, thoroughly were blessed. Uh, God just, God just gave us such a great uh, time with our kids, but it didn't start out that way. And we made a lot of mistakes when they were young. Um, we. Uh, we thought we had it all figured out, but we had a lot to learn. And once we realized we had a lot to learn, God was able to help us. And thankfully, it was early uh, when our kids were still young, and, and God just blessed us. And everyone always told us, oh, just wait, you know, when they were, uh, when they were just in the early ages, uh, six, seven uh, eight, uh, God had been doing a work in our family, and, and everyone said, well, it, you know, wait till they turn to teenagers. Oh, it's all downhill once they turn to teenagers. And uh, when our kids became teenagers, it just kept getting better and better, and it just has gotten better and better. We just have a, a wonderful relationship with our children, and it's a blessing to be able to serve God. And if you'll follow God's principles and you'll apply them in your home, it does get better and better. It just does, and, and it's, uh, it's wonderful now to be able to uh, minister to our grandkids and, and uh, watch our children uh, in particular suffer for the things they afflicted us with when they were younger, you know, and we look at some of the things the grandkids do and we go, that is just like your mother. That is exactly how she acted, and now you can go to her and she will take care of it. And so the best part about grandkids is you can send them home, amen, so... Praise the Lord for that. Stand with me, if you will. We're just going to read one verse. Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. We're going to read one verse, and then we're going to launch from here. We'll be looking at a lot more scripture tonight. But verse number 6, I'm sure a familiar verse for you. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Notice that doesn't say he'll leave and come back to it. But it also doesn't say discipline up a child in the sense of punish a child. It says train up a child. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight that we might 
have understanding from your word of that which you desire for us to know. Help us to make application. And I know some here may not have children as of yet. Maybe some aren't married, but maybe you would bless them someday with the wonderful blessing and gift, the heritage of children. Maybe others have, their children have grown and they have grandchildren now or, or maybe someday will. And I pray that you would give them the understanding tonight to be able to be a minister and a help to their grandchildren and to their kids as they raise their children to be able to help them along the way. Whatever it is that each one needs tonight, I pray that you would use this in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk about this idea of how to train a child for just a little bit. And we're going to look at just a couple aspects or thoughts uh, to give us an, an understanding here. First of all, the phrase train up a, is also translated in our King James Bible as dedicate for specific times. Only once is train up, for other times as dedicate or to bring dedication in their life. And that's kind of an interesting thought to, to, dis, to give them that dedication uh, to the things and, and the way in which they ought to go. The Webster's English Dictionary says it means to discipline, but not by punishment, but to discipline by teaching. Now that's an interesting statement. To discipline by teaching, to bring to a desired state by means of instruction. Now, we'll talk about punishment here in just a little bit uh, because it's certainly a part of training, uh, but it has a proper place. And the problem most parents have is they substitute punishment for training. And they're not the same thing. Train up a child does not just mean, you know, wear them out in punishment. That's not what it means. The scripture is very clear that we're to discipline them by teaching them and bring them to a desired state through the means of instruction. When we look at the scripture, we find that best exemplified in the way that God instructed Israel to train their children in Deuteronomy chapter number 6. So take your Bible, if you will, over to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. In verse number 3 of Deuteronomy 6, we find a passage that the children of Israel, all of Israel, was to memorize and, and recite uh, frequently. And it says in verse number 3 there, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and then when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates. First, I think it's important to understand that we are to train our children with purpose. With purpose. It's not to be haphazard. I think sometimes uh, uh, parents enter into this training process with their children with the idea of we're going to just do what comes along and hope everything works out, but that's not God's intention for the family. God wants us to have a purpose in what we're training our children. It shouldn't be based upon our culture. It shouldn't be based upon what's forced upon us from outside in this secular world. As a Christian parent, we are to have a focus and a direction and a, and a place that we're headed with our kids. And that's what God told Israel as well. I want you to teach them to train them in something very specific, and that is in my commandments. The commandments were to be taught diligently. They were to be discussed. They were to be lived and exemplified in the home. Consider that thought for just a moment of the commandments. Uh, the commandments, uh, we might 
pushed to the idea of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee Im graven images. A and the third commandment, Thou shalt not uh, take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and honor your father and your mother, and, and thou shalt not uh, kill, and thou shalt not uh, bear fault. Let's uh, see, number seven, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not... Uh, steal and thou shalt not bear false witness and thou shalt not covet. I normally do it with my hands. I do this hand motions. I t taught my kids, you know, uh, uh, that no other gods before me and no graven image. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit uh, adultery. It's breaking a, a promise or a covenant. Uh, thou shalt not steal. Uh, thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. Uh, gimme, 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 gimme. So that's how our kids learn <clears throat> the Ten Commandments. That's how I taught them in our home. We, we rehearsed the Ten Commandments and we talked about the Ten Commandments and, and so forth. And, and um, when you think about the Ten Commandments and, and, and isn't it interesting how Satan hates these very basic Ten Instructions that God gave to us, that all of our foundational law and legal system is based on, and Satan hates it with a passion. I mean, how could you, in, a, in the sane mind, how could anyone get up and say, I hate anybody talking about stealing being wrong. How dare you teach your children not to lie? But that's how the world acts when we use the phrase, the Ten Commandments. What an interesting thing. Why is that? Because the foundational thought of the commandments is summarized in Matthew chapter number 22, verse 36 through 40, when the Pharisees and the scribes come to Jesus and they say, Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus summarizes the commandments. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> The first four are of the commandments have to do with loving God and the last six have to do with loving our neighbor. And so those are the summary of the two commandments. Therefore, we might uh, well say that the commandments are for the purpose of teaching, now get this, of teaching how to love. As a matter of fact, that's actually what the Bible says in the New Testament when it says, now the end of the commandment or what the commandments are pointing toward, the goal of the commandment, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Amen. The goal of the Ten Commandments is to teach love. Now listen, the goal of the Ten Commandments is to teach love, not law. And many times we mess up in our homes when we use the commandments as a whipping post against our children instead of as a guide to help them learn love. You understand that the alternate of that is in Romans chapter number 7. At the beginning, love out of a pure heart. But the ending, Romans 7, 7, Paul says this, I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not, anyone remember? Covet. What's the tenth commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Paul said covetousness is lustfulness. It's living according to your own desire. It's living according to your own fleshly uh, impulses and, and wants and, and trying to fulfill yourself. And so you have an alternate here. You see the alternate being on one end of the commandments there is love and on the other end there is lust. Now that's interesting to me. Actually, you could look at the commandments very simply in this fashion that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a set of actions bookended by two attitudes, opposing attitudes, love versus lust. And that actually is the conflict that we have, isn't it? Interestingly, when you consider it in this fashion, you could look at all the commandments from the perspective of love. When you think about the commandments and you think of them from an attitude of these are how God is teaching me to love, you would say, you know, if I love God, I would not worship anyone but Him. And I would never bow down to any graven image. And, and I would never blaspheme and take his name in vain. And, and I would keep holy the things that he says are holy. I would keep everything he said is holy. If I love him, that's not unreasonable, is it? Amen. It's certainly not. 
If I love him, those are reasonable things to do. But not only that, but if I love God, then I'm going to keep holy the things he says are holy. Now consider the fact that everything from this point out is going to give us instruction in how to keep holy or sanctified elements of the the, uh, concepts that uh, affect our culture. For instance... The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Your father and mother are the first authorities in your life. If you cannot learn to honor the authorities that are first in your life, that gave you life, that nurtured and cared for you as you were growing, if you can't learn to honor that authority, you'll not honor any other authority. So the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, is about honoring the, uh, the institution or the, the, uh, the, the uh, hand of God upon authorities in our life. There are four primary authority structures in our lives. The authority of the home being the first, the government, the church, and the employer. And all of us are subject to these authorities. I tell our church, even as a pastor, I'm subject to the authority of the church. I'm not, I'm not the authority of the church. Amen. I'm subject to the authority of the church, just like every church member. The pastor doesn't supersede the Word of God. We're all subject to the Word of God and the, the abiding by it. And so when we learn to love, we would say, okay, so if I love God, I look at these opportunities that God gives me to, to worship Him. To worship only him and never never subjugate my worship to anything else. To never blaspheme his name but to praise his name. To, to uh, keep holy and sanctify the things that he says are holy. To honor authority. To honor life thou shalt not kill. To honor marriage thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, to honor property thou shalt not steal. To honor truth thou shalt not bear false witness. How can I demonstrate love? As a matter of fact, let me take it a step further. In Romans chapter number 13, the Bible says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. And then he goes on and explains that by keeping these commandments, we are demonstrating love to one another. In other words, when he says, Owe no man anything, he says, I don't have to worry about what your expectation of love is from me. What you want me to do is not important. What God says I should do is how I demonstrate love. So I don't have to take expectations from others and try and live up to your expectation of how you think I should love you. I just have to be obedient to the Word of God. And as I'm obedient to the Word of God, I am demonstrating love. And I owe no one anything beyond that. But I do need to understand that concept that these commandments are for the purpose of teaching love. It's important that our kids learn that. Our kids need to learn not just to not hate each other, but how to love each other. That's going to come into play in just a few minutes, okay? But when we look at it from the other perspective, when we look at it from the side of lust, if I'm lusting, go backward. If I'm lusting, then I will lie to fulfill my lust. I will steal to fulfill my lust. Get it? I will break covenants to fulfill my lust. I will kill to fulfill my lust. I will dishonor authority to fulfill my lust. I will violate what is holy to fulfill my lust. I will blaspheme God to fulfill my lust. I will worship myself instead of Him. I will not love Him. Get it? Depends on what perspective you're looking at it. And the problem is a lot of young people grow up in a Christian home. Now listen, they grow up in a Christian home. But they don't grow up understanding the instruction of God as a means whereby I can demonstrate love to others. Instead, they grow up and they receive, they they take upon them our own, our iniquities. We use the term generational sin, but the term generational sin isn't actually used in the Bible. In Exodus and a couple other places, it uses the phrase iniquity. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. The word iniquity is sometimes substituted as sin, but the word actually has to do with the inward attitude about sin and righteousness. Iniquity, as you look through the scriptures, can very easily be seen to be a positive attitude toward sinfulness or 
fleshliness, lustfulness, and a negative attitude toward righteousness. So someone can come to church and keep their kids in a Christian school or homeschool and, and, and do all the right things a Christian ought to do, but in their home, if their attitude is that of glorification of the things they used to do in their sin and a negative attitude toward doing the things that God has asked us to do of keeping His commandments and loving others, and that negative attitude is actually what gets imparted to young people. And that's why kids can grow up in a good church and then leave. Because the attitudes they receive come from how we perceive or how we respond to the commandments of God. And God says we're to raise our kids with purpose. This is what Deuteronomy says. This is what they were to spend time living and talking about and teaching in their home. When they sat down and when they rose up and when they walked in the way, they were supposed to be instructing their kids, this is how to love God and this is how to love our neighbor and God wants us to be people of love. This isn't a thing to browbeat people with. You're not keeping the law. You better keep the law. No, no. This is a means of teaching them love Amen. with purpose. With purpose. Not only that, we should... Train a child with process. What I mean by that is that training is a process. Training is not telling or yelling. A lot of parents stop training at the point which they just tell their kids to go do something. They've never done anything to prepare them to know how to do it. When you look at the scriptures and consider how Jesus trained the disciples. There's five things that jump out to me in, in the scriptures, especially in the book of Mark that, that kind of jump out to me. And I'm not, we're not going to take time tonight to go through the entire book of Mark and, and pull all these out. But I think as I say them, you're going to go, yeah, I remember that. Yes, that makes sense. I get that. All right. And then you're going to also probably see the same pattern in the way you were trained in various places or times in your life. Okay. So the first thing that Jesus did was he instruct, instruction. He taught. Right? He taught them. He taught them truth. He taught them uh, the, the, the way in which they ought to go. And, and he showed them through his instruction uh, verbally. And instruction is a very important part of training. Before we expect anyone to do anything, we ought to tell them how it's to be done. Not, no, not tell them to do it. Tell them how it should be done. And what the desired outcome is. The process, if you will. Then there's demonstration. Jesus demonstrated for the disciples what it is he wanted them to do. He didn't just say, go love people. right? He taught them what love was, and he demonstrated love. He didn't just say, go preach. He taught them about how to teach and preach, and then he demonstrated that. He didn't just say, go heal. He taught them about healing, and then he demonstrated healing. They observed this on their own, they, he, the demonstration. And then, this is an interesting one, participation. I'm going to pull this back into this thought in a second of uh, dealing with our kids. Participation. They were part of what Jesus was doing. Jesus broke the bread and put it in the baskets and said, all right, take this out. Go feed them. Now go gather back up the fragments and bring them back. Now take them over to the house of this family. Right? They were participants in the process of training. Number four, observation. Jesus would remove himself. He'd give them a task and he would remove himself and he would watch them do the task. And he would see it. It's interesting when you read about Jesus going up into the, the mountain. If you've been to Israel, a lot of times he would withdraw up into a mountain. In, in, at the Sea of Galilee, um, basically everything around the sea is a mountain. So he just kind of went up the hillside, if you will, just a little bit, right up the, the side of the, uh, of the mountain there. And from there he could watch them out on the sea and see what it was they were doing. He would observe them. Isn't it interesting? He observed them and then in the middle of the tempest, in the middle of the storm, he went and walked out there by them. And then he corrected. Now, instruction, demonstration, participation, observation, and correction is the proper way to train somebody. You ever had a job? I hope. Right? You get there, first day on the job, boss says, okay, we're going to make widgets today. Go make them. Is that how it works? Boss, I, I don't know how to make a widget. 
What do you mean you don't have to make a widget? We hired you, didn't you? Go make one. Come on, get it on. Go get it done. Just go figure it out. Right? Would you be frustrated? That's how kids feel a lot of times, by the way. Hey, go do this. I don't know how to do that. What do you mean you don't know how to do it? Yeah. Instruction. You go into the classroom your first day and they say, this is a widget. Here's the process for making widgets. This is the outcome we desire, right? Here's, here's what a widget ought to look like. Here's some problems that might come along in the process of making widgets. Here's your specific task in the making of widgets. Anyone following along with me? You understand what I'm saying? All right. Instruction, they taught you or told you what it was you were going to be doing and walked you through the process, maybe even gave you a manual. And then they said, come on. Now that you've been told, let's go out to the line and I want to demonstrate for you how you do this job. You take this part, you put it in here, you pull this lever and push this button and then you uh, pull it out and you put it over here and this is the process. Watch me do it. Stand here and observe me for a while while I do it. Is that how it works? Now? All right. Let's do it together. Come on. Let me see. Come on. Let's do it. That, no, that's not right. Stop. You got to push that button first. Demonstration, participation, observation, and then correction. And all of these things go into training. They go into everything you've been trained for. And by the way, it's interesting to me that most successful companies don't stop training at, after your initial training. They have continuing education, don't they? They continue to train. There's more for you to learn. And sometimes they go back and they review what you've learned before. I, I'm often um, uh, humored by the, the old account of um, uh, the uh, coach, uh, Vince Lombardi. You ever heard the story? Sure, surely you have, right? They, they were in the championship game and they lost to the New York football giants, right? And so at, at spring practice the next year, Lombardi decided we're going to start from scratch. And he walked in and to demonstrate how serious he was about starting from scratch, he started with this phrase, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> By the way, if you ever read the book that, that details all that, it's interesting because many of them were upset. We are professional footballers. We, we do not talk to us like that. But, you know, they went on a winning spree after that where they won championship after championship. Why? Because they went back and did proper training. You're not doing these little things right. You need to get started at the very beginning again. I wonder how impactful this would be in our homes. I know how impactful it would be. If we would stop just telling and yelling at our kids... And we would get back to the basics of training our children on the fundamental issues and levels of things in the home. Process. I mean, what process are you following in your home for training your kids? There ought to be something that you're using as a guidepost of how I go through a training process with my children. What process am I using so that I don't have expectations of my kids that are up here while their understanding is down here? It'll create frustration. Having a process of training in the home makes a big difference. Train up a child <clears throat> with patience. Psalm 86, 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and of gracious long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and in truth. How does God train you? That word long-suffering is a good indication. Patient. God, God suffers with us a lot. And if you have kids, you feel that way about them probably. Some of that's your own fault because of a lack of proper process in your training and a lack of proper direction or purpose in your training. But when you get those things right, you still have to be patient. When you get a job and you, you're working in your job, do you want your boss to come fire you after the first mistake you make? Or do you want him to be patient with you? Long-suffering. 
take you aside and say, okay, now here's where you're messing up. Let's go back through this process. Let's see what we've missed and how we can correct this and how we can get this right. And, and going through that process, again, long-suffering. Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 12 and 13 tells us that we're to put this attitude on. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. We're to put this on in our life. And if we are to put this on in our life, it only stands to reason that it ought to be exhibited in our relationship with our children. My um, Early in our marriage, we had a problem. And that problem was me. And I would come home and I would hang my Christianity at the door. You know, I'd take it off, put it at the door. And then I would walk in my home according to my will and my lust, my desires. And I wasn't being the, a Christian at home that I ought to be. I wasn't leading my home according to the word of God. I was leading it according to my will. I wasn't long-suffering. I wasn't patient. I wasn't kind. And it put a price on our home, a toll on our home. I have to lead with patience. God is patient with us. We're to put on patience. And we're to exhibit it with our spouse. We're to exhibit that patience with our children. They're the ones that are closest to us. If anyone looks at you and says, that person is a patient person, if anyone says that, it ought to be your spouse. Do they? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. Uh, uh, patience is you know, not something I was gifted with. It's not a gift. Well, I just don't have it. I don't know what to do about it. Well, God says what you can do about it. Put it on. Make the decision to put it on. Say, well, how does that work? Oh, you know. You do know because you've probably made this statement before. Don't pray for patience. Because why? Trials. But it isn't interesting what James says. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Isn't it interesting we spend our time resisting God's perfecting work in us instead of yielding to it? God wants to perfect you as a parent. God wants to perfect you as a spouse. God wants to perfect you as a believer. And so he allows trials to come into our life for the purpose of perfecting us. But instead of becoming perfect in those things, we're constantly pushing against him and trying to figure a way out of them instead of figuring a way to allow him to work in us to bring us through them. To make us better. To make us what he desires. Yes, patience is necessary. And when you're training your children, they are certainly going to be used of God to help develop it in you. Hmm. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. When they're not responding like you want them to respond, remember, God's trying to help me become more patient. I don't have to resist that. I need to depend on Him in this moment. And not get in the flesh. What's Galatians 5.16 say? Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, how are you walking when you're dealing with your kids and they're not quite responding like you want them to? More prone to the flesh than the spirit? Therein lies the problem. So with patience and then with principles. Someone once said, rules without reason produce rebellion. Rules should be based upon reason and particularly upon reason from the Scripture. We want to establish character in our kids. That's what we're trying to train into them. Train up a child in the way he should go. That meaning train them in the fashion in which you want them or the type of person you want them to be. I want them to be a person that loves God, number one, and loves their neighbor, so I must train them or teach them the commandments and demonstrate those in their life. But uh, Angela and I, when we were first learning, uh, when our kids were relatively young, thankfully, we were first learning, we, we started discussing, well, what kind of person do we want them to be? You ever had that discussion? What kind of person 
do I want my child to be? I'm not talking about what do I want them to do. I'm not saying, do I want them to be a doctor or a preacher or this or that. The, the, what they do is far less important than who they are. Amen. What kind of person do I want them to be? And we started talking about that, about different act, attributes we wanted in our kids. Uh, we talked about adding the attribute of personal responsibility. We want them to be a person that takes responsibility for themselves and, and isn't, uh, isn't constantly blaming everyone else. So we set some rules up in our home like, you know, put up what you get out. Why? Because you got to take responsibility for yourself. Not just because I don't want to have to clean it up. Hello. But because you need to take responsibility for your actions. So when you get something out, you need to put it up. Clean up what you mess up. Kids are messy. They're going to make messes. Just got to accept that. But they need to be taught to clean it up after they make it. Or else they're being a burden to others. They're not taking personal responsibility. Every person in our house was assigned chores. And they had to be completed at a required time. They, they weren't allowed to just continually put them off and put them off and put them off. We wanted to teach them that there are certain things that have to be done at a certain time. You need to do them when they're necessary to be done. And by the way, you say, what are you talking about here? These are literally the rules from our home. We have a sheet, actually. It's two pages long, and this is the first set of rules in our home. And, and it's labeled just like this, personal responsibility. And when the kids would violate one of these rules, we would have a discussion about why this rule was important. Because this rule isn't just a rule to keep mom and dad from getting upset or, or to keep the house clean. This rule is because we want you to be someone who has personal responsibility in your life that takes responsibility for the things that you do. This is important. You understand how many young people or how many people in our day have no concept of personal responsibility? Wouldn't it be wonderful if parents had been teaching their children, you need to be responsible for the things that you do? We'd have a different country right now. But we have a country full of people that, that take no personal thought and they'll go out and protest about the environment and then as they're driving down the road, throw their trash right out the window. <sighs> personal responsibility. They want the government to fix it. Had a had a lady one time, this is kind of funny. This is funny to me, actually. Now, a lady one time got upset that we took up offerings. And she said, I just don't think that's right. I think the church just should pay the bills. <laughs> I agree. Who's the church? Amen. Right? Personal responsibility? Yeah? How about kindness? I want my kids to learn kindness. So we have a rule in the house. Talk kindly to everybody in the house. Talk kindly. If you... If you're not talking kindly, you've broken a rule. Because kindness is something God wants us to have in our lives. And we would take scriptures and write out scriptures about these different topics. Uh, be considerate of other people's possessions. Don't touch other people's stuff without asking permission. We categorize all of our rules just like this. Uh, respect. Uh, never, here's our rules for under respect. Never use foul language or call names. Obey authority when you're asked to do something. No back talking or arguing. You have these same rules in your house. I'm just saying that part of the problem that we have is that we're not teaching the principles. The rules, unfortunately, often seem to a young person as random. They don't seem to have any purpose other than just your whim. But when we put structure to them and we give them a principle that this rule is for the purpose of enforcing this characteristic that is desirable in your life, that God wants to have in your life, it makes a difference, especially as they become teenagers, by the way. Thankfulness. No murmuring or complaining. Say please and thank you when you want something or are given something. Simple rules, they were, they're, they're reinforcing a principle or characteristic diligence once you start a job you must finish it don't leave any task unfinished if you have the means to finish it you cannot quit anything unless you first discussed it with dad and received approval a lot of quitters in our day don't quit why 
because you need to be a diligent person. It's going to affect you later on in life. You may not understand it right now while you're standing here with this task that you've started and you don't want to finish, but someday, knowing that you finished something, it'll help you. I read this the other day. I was reading an article about ADD. It said that statistically... Um, Children in single-parent homes, single-mother homes, have higher, significantly higher rates of ADD than children that are in families with both parents. And as they did this study, they, they kind of correlated this idea that, that the reason that they have higher, uh, lower rates of ADD in two-parent homes is because dads are more likely to make kids finish something before they get the reward. And moms are more likely... To let him have the reward without finishing because she doesn't want to deal with the fight. And it contributes to the development of ADD. That's interesting to me. Amen. Diligence, delayed gratification, finish what you start, you can't quit. My dad, one day, he took the dictionary we, in our family devotions. He took the dictionary, and he opened it up to the cues, and he said, uh, give me the scissors, and he cut the word quit out of the dictionary, tore it up, threw it in the trash. He said, I just want you guys to know, quit is not in our dictionary, right? <laughs> he did that. Quit is not in our dictionary. I tell our church men, the Bible says, quit ye like men. What's that mean? When do men, when do men quit? When the job's done. That's when you can quit. When you've finished your task. Then you stop. Quit like a man. Be diligent. Develop that attitude. We want our kids to have these attitudes. As a matter of fact, uh, for us, we did this when, when our kids were young because we wanted to instill these principles. We had these rules and, and they were uh, organized. They're organized according to the characteristics that we sat down and looked through the scriptures. These are characteristics that God wants a person to have and these are the rules that seem to apply. And when something would come up and, and uh, it wouldn't make any sense, uh, uh, we would implement that uh, new rule. You know, that was always the last rule. Uh, mom and dad can, can implement new rules rules as needed, you know, and we would put them in there, but um, we moved out to the country, and, and we got our, uh, we started a farm, and, um, and started raising animals, and so we would have more chores, which didn't feel like they were working hard enough. I told my kids, I did tell them this, I, hard work was one of our work ethic, it was one of our principles. I told my kids, I want you to work hard enough at home that when you become old enough to work for yourself, you want to. You can stay at home and work for free for me forever. But I want it to be hard enough to do that at home that you don't want to do it for very long. When you turn 18, I want you to go get a job and make something out of your life. We're missing that in our day. We have a generation of young men particularly who have no drive to do anything. They have no goal, they have no vision, they have no desire to make anything of themselves because they've never had to do anything. There is something valuable about being out when it's 100 degrees, building a fence, sweating to death and being all dirty and grimy and nasty and getting to the end of that fence and looking back and say, we didn't quit. Amen. We finished it. Amen. There's diligence and there's hard work and look at the reward. Now we can buy, you know, cows. Isn't that rewarding? <laughs> and now we can get cows and you can start milking them in the morning. <laughs> Woo! Finally, oh, there's some more principles there. When necessary, when necessary with punishment. If you'll do the first parts properly, punishment becomes very limited later on. The reason some parents end up ruling their home with punishment is because they didn't do the first parts properly. And they're frustrated. And they're worn out. This is after you've done all the other steps. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. There are times when they violate the rules, there are times they need to be disciplined. Now let me just quickly, when and how to administer discipline. Four things, just quickly. First of all, after you've properly trained, never before. A child should not be disciplined for something they have not been trained to do. 
and you need to evaluate if they're doing it because if they're not doing it because they're rebellious and they're saying I ain't going to do it, that's one thing, that's disciplinary. But if they're not doing it because they don't know how to do it, then you need to stop and train them properly. Secondly, early. At the first offense of a properly trained child, that's when discipline ought to happen. That's why you're so frustrated because you discipline after this process. Why didn't you do it? I told you to do it. Now go do it or else. If you do that one more time, I told you already, and we go through this one, two, three, four, five warnings. If they've been properly trained and they know the rules and they understand the reason for the rules, when they violate the rule, that's the time to discipline. A lot of parents would solve a lot of problems in their own frustration if they would follow these principles, by the way. Thirdly, consistently. Inconsistency produces confusion and frustration in a child. What's it say in Ephesians 6, 4? Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That means train them properly. Don't be inconsistent. By the way, a lot of times inconsistency has to do with dad enforcing the rules one way and mom enforcing them a different way or not at all. And just keep saying, wait till your dad gets home. The rule should be consistently enforced every time, all the time. Amen. And then lovingly. Discipline should never be done in anger. And dis discipline should never be done without admonition toward proper reason and character. Discipline should always reinforce that the reason these rules are here is to help you become the type of person that will have a good life, a wonderful life, to love God, to love your neighbor, to be able to be successful in this life. Discipline is not, should not just be for our whim or our convenience. If it is, we're going to breed rebellion and we're going to, as the Bible says in Ephesians 6, we're going to uh, provoke our children to wrath. Discipline should be done lovingly. And when we keep these other concepts, we can discipline lovingly. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. One of the most wonderful things in life, and I can say this now on the other side of my kids, right? My kids are all grown, and one of the most wonderful things in life is being able to look at my kids and see what they're doing in their life. My, my oldest two daughters married young men who are surrendered to ministry. They're, they're serving God right now. One of them's a youth director. One of them's an assistant pastor. My son is in preparation for ministry. And being able to look at their lives and see the decisions they make and, and for them to come and say, Dad, I, may, I need to make this decision. I want to make sure I do what God wants here. And being able to counsel them and look at that and to look back and say, Man, I'm glad I trained them. I'm not glorifying me in that. I'm just saying God's way works is what I'm trying to say. Amen. That, that God's way works. You need to put it into practice. If you're not, you need to put it into practice and God will bless it. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father, thank you so much for the principles of your word, the truth of your word. And thank you for children. I thank you for the heritage you've given through our children. And what a blessing it is to see in this church, just like in our own, so many young people, so many young families and kids growing up. And Lord, we want to see them have successful, wonderful, godly lives. Lord, I want these parents to be able to look with joy upon their children being raised and say thank God for what God's word taught us and use it Lord to raise up a godly generation that will serve you and follow you pray that you'd use this in our hearts tonight in Jesus name Amen